So my name is Scott Carley. I'm the Curator of Museum Services at the Alaska State Museum. My training is as a conservator, and I moved up to Alaska to work uh, at the Alaska State Museum in 2000 to be the conservator there. But this past June, uh, our Curator of Museum Services retired, and he was responsible for doing statewide outreach in um, the areas uh, other than collections care, which is what my specialty is. So when he retired, my boss asked me if I would take over the whole statewide outreach. So I was doing collections care outreach for museums around the state. Uh, and he asked me to do uh, everything else. So it's been a kind of a learning curve for me to um, deal with things other than conservation, because that's my training. So um, now I'm kind of doing a, a broader thing. But I am, I am a conservator by training, which means that my specialty is uh, preventive conservation. It's kind of like risk management, if you think about it that way. Um, it's not the very glamorous uh, Sistine Chapel type restoration where you get to reveal something that's all hidden by dirt. Um, but it, it's more of the fundamental trying to care for collections and, and to be able to hand them off to the next generation in good condition. Um, so I put together a, a a short program today. I have some slides to show you, and I have this handout if anybody wants to um, get the handout. And I don't really want this to be just me telling you how to care for regalia. Uh, I'm sure that you have your, your own ideas and your own ways of caring for regalia, and I think that's terrific. Uh, what I would like is for this to be more of a phil philosophical discussion about um, caring for things in general. And uh, sometimes the functions of objects require for them to be out with the people and to be in dances or out receiving um, things when they, when they return to uh, this area. I know that a lot of regalia is, is brought out during um, those times or during uh, celebration. So there's kind of this whole use aspect, which isn't really uh, how my training uh, is or how we do things in museums. Um, so I'm trying to balance between the two. And um, I w I'll show you kind of how I think about caring for things, and then you can kind of match that with how you think about caring for things. And some, it's somewhere there'll be some crossover and s hopefully some useful things um, that will help you. Um, I also I have slides to show. And there's maybe about 30 minutes worth of slides, and 45 if I talk too long. but. After that, I'd like to open it up, and you can ask me any questions that you have uh, about, about particular things. That's um, really the way I function best is if I have something really concrete. So if you have a very specific question, um, please ask me. If you see something on one of the slides that you have a question about, this is a small enough crowd, just, you can just ask me right as soon as the slide is up, because it's, it's better to see it and ask it right, when it's right there rather than to wait to the end. But if you have a question that's just more general, we'll hold those till the end, and then I can, can address all of those. So I'd like to start off with, I'm going to show three pictures of three baskets. And uh, baskets aren't really, um, I guess, considered regalia, although basketry hats could be. Um, but the reason why I'm going to show you these three baskets is because um, these three baskets are in the collection of the Alaska State Museum. And they're all um, about 80 to 100 years old. And I'll go through them again so you can see. And they're all very old baskets. They've been with our collection since, um, and they're older than that, but they've been in our collection since um, the teens and the 20s. And I'm, I'm showing these just to illustrate how uh, really the materials that things are made of, uh, especially here in the southeast, plant materials, animal materials, those types of things, they're, they're fairly stable on their own. And if we just care for them and kind of prevent damage from happening to them, they actually last a long time. So these baskets didn't have anything done to them. They, didn't, they weren't dunked in water once a year. They weren't coated with anything in particular. They were just um, really prevented from uh, getting damaged. That's all that we really did to them. And that's kind of how I'm going to start this talk off, is just talking about how we think about damage in the museum world and then we'll kind of try and relate that to uh, 
the world of, of using regalia out out in the in the world, <laughs> in the real world. Um, so when I'm thinking about damage at the museum, kind of as a, a risk manager, I think of those six areas that I think of. And these are the six things, I tried to reduce it down to six things that I think cause all the damage. Some of these are pretty general, some of them are very specific. So I think of temperature and humidity. That's one area that can cause a lot of damage. You can see damage on artifacts. I can go around to different museums and I can tell whether it's been something that's caused by um, it being too dry, things um, stretching and splitting. Those would be drums or sometimes skin-covered boats that happens to, even models. Um, too, too moist and you get mold on things. Uh, temperature, if it's too hot, obviously things can start to melt or um, uh, shrink uh, because of high temperatures. Too low, things become brittle, things can separate. Light, for example, uh, I know we have to have light to see things, but uh, light actually has a lot of energy in it and can cause a lot of fading on materials, so I see that a lot. Uh, and pests, that's something that we don't think a lot about. Um, pests is a big general category. Um, it could be somebody showed me a basket that their dog had gotten a hold of. Uh, and so maybe their dog is or is not a pest, but uh, animals can chew on things. Um, the main thing in museums, though, that we worry about are very small insects that um, can come into the museum either on other people's clothes or on food or on flowers that are brought in. So we have kind of uh, strict policies about uh, what types of materials are brought into the museums and what we do with them. So pests are a big problem. Uh, dust and pollutions, or pollution, uh, dust, dust is pretty much everywhere. At the State Museum, we put in a, a very large filtering system so we can actually filter the air that's um, in and around our exhibits, and that helps a lot. That's not really a, a good option for um, people in their homes. That can be uh, difficult to do. Uh, pollution, that can come from the outside. That can be from cars, or it could even be from um, Mount Edgecombe you know, spewing gases, um, Mount Augustine, those are uh, different sources of pollution. Pollution can also come from the inside, and that's why in museums we're very careful uh, what materials we, we store with other materials. So I'm sure that you've all heard about acid-free this or acid-free that. Um, in museums we tend to use a lot of acid-free materials because we don't want those types of pollutants to get on the objects and to change them. And then probably the biggest category is human interactions, and this is where I lump kind of everything that we do to objects um, during handling or uh, sometimes if we aren't careful, something might slide off of a table. That would be a human interaction that would cause damage. Theft, that's another human interaction. If something's stolen from a museum or from your place, then that's, that's definitely uh, a lot of damage. You may never see that piece again. And then the last category of disasters, well, disasters are, could be anything from uh, a tsunami coming in here, and we'd have to evacuate everything at the Sheldon Jackson Museum, or disasters can be small, and, and uh, I've worked in museums for 20 years now, and um, I've actually had four times where we've had sort of mini disasters, mostly related to water pipes leaking. So that's kind of a little disaster that can cause a lot of damage. So that's all for the uh, word slides, I promise you. We're going to just look at some other pictures. So what do museums do to preserve uh, artifacts, especially the kind of artifacts that might relate to Alaska? Um, a series of these pictures were taken at the National Museum of the American Indian. I used to work there before I came to Alaska. Um, they work very hard to keep things in good condition. The conditions that were in the storage areas um, prior to it becoming a Smithsonian Museum were pretty bad, they were pretty cramped, um, and so now they're trying to really overcome that and give these um, a much better home for these artifacts. And I just want to show this um, particular, see if I can get my arrow back up here. You can see that um, the materials that are used here are all acid free. Um, they've even created these little pillows for the feathers so that the feathers rest on those and they don't incur too much damage. They've got um, down here at the bottom, they have individual little cutouts in foam for each one of these uh, little dangly pieces here to keep them from knocking against each other. So 
if this um, were just to be in, in, in this case, it would probably last uh, a millennium or two. And museums even go to that effort on, on things that were really quite utilitarian uh, at the time, like these carving knives. These were made to be used. They're quite hardy. Uh, they actually show a lot, of, a lot of wear and tear, really nice what we call a patina of age on the surface here. You can see how they were, they've gone, they've had a life. That's good. Um, so why bother putting them in such a, an elaborate case with all of these uh, acid-free materials? And that's because what we're trying to do is to have as, as little change as possible to them. Even though they were utilitarian, we don't want any further damage to occur or further changes to occur. So along those themes, I'm just showing some pictures to of the extent to which museums can go to really preserve objects. And we can kind of try and transfer some of these ideas to regalia that might be in use and taken out often. Uh, so here you can see the idea is everything has its own little place and nothing's going to rattle around and, and knock against anything else. Same idea here, even though not quite as elaborate, um, just having everything in its own box. And that's something that um, I've, uh, in my capacity at the State Museum, often people uh, will come to me and ask me about regalia. They will ask me about materials that aren't in the museum, but things that they have in their own collections. Uh, and at one point, somebody brought a box. It was a fairly large box of material and brought it. And we brought it in. We set it out on the table and started taking things out of it. And that box was, was absolutely stuffed with material. Uh, it had several masks. It had uh, several... Uh, robes, it had several gloves, it had just all kinds of things in there. And they were all just sort of stacked on one another. And that's where you tend to get a lot of damage occurring is when things are just not in their own little box or their own little bag. So that's going to be a theme that I'll, I'll come back to uh, again in this talk is that in order to keep things from being damaged, we really want to see them in, in their own little package. Again, we have uh, museum uh, quality uh, storage cases in our museum, obviously. Um, they are they're powder coated, uh, baked on enamel finishes. Now, why do we bother getting that? It's because if you have just spray coated uh, finishes on wood, that will off gas a pollutant that will gather in there and start to damage artifacts. So that's why we bother to pay thousands of dollars more to have baked on enamel finishes. And then, you know, we have these drawers in here, and what we do is we try and define the individual little places. For, for each artifact. So we put these, these uh, types of foams in there and even acid-free tissue paper. So this is kind of the extent. Or we'll even carve out of a very stable foam called ethafoam. It's just basically polyethylene, very stable plastic. We'll carve out little spaces for these, um, for these uh, carvings so that they don't rattle against each other and start to chip and get damaged. And even something utilitarian like a spoon, not a lot of decoration on them. We still don't want to see them rattle around and get any, any more damage over the years. Because in the museum, we operate w in what's called the public trust. And that may not mean a lot to you if you aren't working in a museum. But the public trust is the idea that we get money from the public, whether it's from municipal dollars or from entry fees or from the federal government. We get money, and in return, we care for these artifacts. That's the public trust. And in doing that, we care for them in what's called in perpetuity, which is a fancy word for saying forever. So we've decided to, to, that our part of the bargain is we'll care for these forever. And when you start talking about forever, that's when you get really kind of uh, compulsive about even little bits of damage, because little bits of damage over uh, a long period of time can result in a lot of damage. So that's why museums go to the lengths that we do to care for things. Even this, these grease dishes, for example, we've taken a, a very stable type of foam and we've wrapped each individual grease dish so it doesn't knock about. And you know, over time, even in my lifetime, I might, might not even be able to see that much damage. But some of these pieces are hundreds of years old. And over their lifetime, they've already sustained a great deal of damage. So what we're trying to do is keep them in the condition that they are. Again, these rattles. Each individual one has its own little tray, those sorts of things. This is a basket. This is a, a California basket by a very well-known basket maker. Her name was Dot Salale. And I, 
I built this um, I built this box for for this basket when I was working at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. This basket was uh, valued at that time at a half a million dollars. It was one of the most expensive baskets on the market. Now it's probably well over a million dollars. Um, so it's just a basket. It's just made out of plant fibers. It's a very valuable basket. So what I did was I created this very elaborate uh, drop shell ba box for it so that we could take it in and out without having the box itself do any damage to it. So when you add something that's worth a million dollars, then you can, I can spend a week making a box for it. This is another, bo uh, another very elaborate box that I made for the Peabody Museum at Harvard. Now they got this collection of um, pretty modern Pueblo pottery that was sold, it's tourist pottery. So it doesn't have a very high value to it, but they got a very large collection of this material that was, was um, donated in one, sort of one donation. And the interesting thing about this pottery or this collection is that it was in such pristine condition. It was, it was nearly perfect. The collector had been very careful about keeping it um, pristine. And if you've seen any type of this modern Pueblo pottery, it has a very, um, a very matte surface and it's not uh, highly fired. It's uh, painted and that surface can, uh, can be marred very quickly. So any kind of damage can mar that surface. And what, what the curators thought was very interesting about this is that it was just so perfect. So again, I, I developed this elaborate box system where these pieces drop out and then you can pick this up and, and um, get it out of that box without damaging. You see that it's a lamp, so it's a pretty, it's, it's almost like um, an Americana piece. So now here we are in the world of, of regalia. So we have the world of a museum where uh, you can put everything in these very special boxes. You can spend a week uh, building a box for something. You have the materials there. They're all acid free. Uh, that's not really the world of objects that are in use. And this is something that I kind of had to learn when I came up here. This is seeing a lot of objects in use, seeing a lot of important objects in use has been a, an education for me coming from a museum background. And I've actually gotten pretty comfortable with seeing objects in use. I think it's a great idea. I think it's, it's, uh, it's really a, a wonderful part of a living culture to see objects that are in use. I don't want to see them all in a museum, so don't think that that's what I'm about. But I do think that uh, if, we, if we want these objects to stay in use for a long period of time, uh, that a certain rudimentary amount of care is necessary. And so that's why I'm trying to marry common sense with sort of the practices that I learned. Because as a risk manager, as a risk manager for objects, if you ask me how to keep things from getting damaged, well, I wouldn't necessarily take them out on the dock and catch a can and parade them around. I mean, that's just the way I am. So, and this was, uh, this was a shot that was taken at the, uh, at when the Harriman expedition showed up in Ketchikan in 2001. Uh, they brought back a lot of materials, poles that were brought back, and this was a ceremony to receive these poles. And I was actually there. This is me, and this is my wife. She wasn't my wife at the time, but about three weeks later, we eloped. So, anyway, you might recognize other people, but this is a you know a great gathering where a lot of regalia came out. So, thinking about the two worlds of kind of museums and how we can be really, really careful with everything, and we can put all sorts of restrictions on everything, and then the world of regalia. Uh, I'm trying to point out some ideas that we've had that might actually work for things that are in use. Drums, for example. Drums are in use. A lot of drums are, are fashioned with uh, a skin that's pulled over a frame, usually a wooden frame. And what that causes is a lot of tension in that drum. And either the skin splits or if the skin is tough enough, the frame um, gets this terrible warping in it. So that's just something we had to deal with. So what we started to do at the State Museum uh, is we started to create these pillows that we put inside the drums uh, to prevent damage from occurring. And what, what these pillows do is they actually keep the vibration down while we're moving them around or, or even when they're on display or in storage. And it also provides um, what we call a buffer for uh, temperature and humidity. So it adds as, as kind of like a blanket. And it's made out of cotton, so that's important. Cotton actually has a huge surface area that absorbs and gives off moisture. So this cotton, if the drum starts getting dry, the cotton will actually give up moisture to the drum. 
So we've started doing that with, with pretty good results. And that's something that I would say that if you have drums uh, and you want to just any kind of cotton material, whether it's a, a towel or you can make a, an elaborate quilt out of cotton batting like we've made, um, but that is something that uh, will really help your drum in the long run. So that's an idea I think that could carry over. Here's another picture of it. It's just what we have sometimes at the museum is we have people who volunteer their time and we're looking for activities for them. So we had one woman that really knew how to quilt, so she made all these little quilts for our drums. And this is what it looks like. So we store it with that quilt in it. I also have, I have handouts up here if anybody um, after the lecture wants to um, get a handout on just some, uh, some ideas. So next thing I'd like to talk about are insects. I know this is something none of us really like to think about, but there are insects uh, that live in our houses with us, and they, uh, they are very uh, interested in eating proteinaceous material. Um, they're in the, um, in the industry, in the pest industry, they're called stored product beetles, is what they're called. Um, there are certain uh, varied species of beetles that uh, are in with uh, pet food, for example, they're in, sometimes they're in um, food that we might consume, like rice or flour. So the, the food industry has gotten really good at, at uh, keeping these out of the factories and taking care of them. But the museum, and the museums are kind of on the same page with that, we're, we're concerned about them coming into the museum and attacking artifacts on, on display. And I've been, uh, I travel around for my job, I've been to a number of museums, and uh, I uh, can almost always find insect damage on artifacts that are on display. So uh, a lot of people think, well, we're Alaska, we're way up here, it's really cold, the insects don't have a chance, but that's just really not the case. There is a lot of damage um, that occurs during, while they're on display or in storage. So um, I have uh, some suggestions of what to do about that, which I'll get to in a moment. Here's a, another example of, um, I'm showing you the artifact as a Navajo weaving model. Um, and here's a close-up of it. And I want to show you this area here. This is insect damage that's occurred. So is this, this piece right here. This is um, done from a webbing clothes moth. Uh, and the clothes moth uh, lays its larva, or lays an egg on wool material. And that larva grows into a sort of a worm that you may or may not be able to see. The worm eats the wool, uh, creates a cocoon even using bits of the wool. So there's actually a cocoon inside of here. Then it uh, molts and comes out as a moth, and the moth looks like this. It's usually white. If you see the moth, uh, the, it doesn't really do any good to kill it uh, because the moth uh, doesn't eat anything. It, it, does, it has vestigial um, eating apparatus. It doesn't actually digest anything. It, its sole purpose is to fly around, find a mate, and lay some more eggs, and then it dies. Um, this is what the, the larva look like. So they're about, um, probably about a quarter of an inch long. And the way you can tell these moths, as opposed to any other moth that's flying around, is that they're, um, they're always white, or sort of pale white, almost like a cream color. But they have no spots or no decoration at all, because they don't need to hide from predators. They don't live outside. They mostly live indoors um, with our materials. Uh, and they have really raggedy edges to their wings. So uh, just the other, about three months ago, we uh, caught one of these in a trap at the Sheldon Jackson Museum. And we had it analyzed. And they said, yes, this is a webbing clothes moth. So it's the kind that we're worried about. So somehow that moth got into the museum. Probably uh, what happens is when tourists come, they come to their trip of the lifetime, lifetime to Alaska, and they go, you know, they're from Florida or Arizona, and they get out the old woolens out of the trunk they haven't used for a while, and that's where the moths have been in there working on them. So they put them on, they wear them up here, and that's how they get into um, our part of the, the country or our museums. This is a domestic beetle. This is one of those stored product beetles that I was talking about. The um, black measurement here, this is a, a centimeter, so you can see that it's it's not very big. It's, it's about the size of a grain of rice. Um, you, you wouldn't necessarily see one of these around unless you were trapping for them. And that's what we do in the museum. We set traps to find these beetles. Um, but they're, they're definitely in your houses. They're in everybody's houses. So it's just something we live with. What we don't want to happen is for them to start uh, eating our, 
our regalia or our artifacts and, and putting holes in them and weakening them and those sorts of things. So what do we do about those? Well, one thing is um, I think regalia actually has a better chance uh, against bugs because just the act of getting it out into the air, into the light, looking at it, that's, um, that's a good thing. Uh, just having something stored away for a long period of time without ever looking at it uh, increases its chances of, of being attacked by insects. So that's something that's positive by regalia is that we probably have less insect damage because it's, it's always sort of out in the light and the insects, um, they don't particularly like that. What they like is, is dark and quiet so they can just get to work on things. So if you do have uh, damage that you think is present, I don't advise using pesticides on them. Pesticides are not good for anybody, and they leave a residue. So just spraying something down with a pesticide is really not going to solve the problem, and it's going to endanger people's health. So we don't do that in museums anymore. It was done for a long time, but we don't do it anymore. What we do now is we freeze everything, and this is part of our whole trying to keep insects out of the museum. We put things in plastic bags, and here you see this is in a plastic bag, and we put it down in a chest-style freezer, you can do this in a home freezer, you know, even, even uh, the type that's on the top of your refrigerator, you can still do it. It just takes longer. In this style of freezer that we have at the museum, we can do it in about a week. But if you have a home style freezer, you need to put it in for a week, take it out for a day, don't take it out of the bag, and put it in for a week again. And the reason is because the home style freezers aren't cold enough to kill the eggs. And what will happen is once it's been cold and it comes out and it's warm again, those eggs will start to hatch and the second round will, will kill them. Now those instructions are on this little sheet here so you don't have to worry about remembering that. And here we're looking at dust. Uh, dust is something we live with every day. We don't really think a lot about it, but it can act as, as tiny little knives, especially dust that's um, from a glacial source. It tends to get um, you know, a lot of uh, very sharp elements in it, even though it's very fine. And what, what, you can, uh, what can happen is you can see along here, this zone right here, which is a different color and it it's, um, looks like it's been eaten away, that's, that happened because of dust. And dust gets in there and works on a very microscopic level. It also attracts moisture and dust has a lot of bacteria in it. So all of those elements together can actually cause damage. So keeping dust off of things in general um, will keep them in better shape. So I advise um, either you know, shaking things out or dusting them off with a soft paintbrush, especially feathers. So if you have feathers on your regalia, keeping the dust off of them will um, actually keep those feathers in better shape for a longer time. What we do at the museum is anytime we can, we put things in those um, cabinets that I was talking about, those seal out the dust, or we put everything in plastic bags. So I would advise plastic bags. A lot of people are worried about plastic bags, but there's really no harm in putting something in a plastic bag. Nothing is really going to happen to it. As long as it isn't in a wet environment, so as long as you aren't storing your regalia in the basement or the attic, having it, if it's just in your closet and you put it in a Ziploc type, type bag, there's really nothing that's going to, um, going to happen to it. So I, I even recommend um, if you have button blankets or, or tunics, I recommend those um, large style Ziploc um, garment bags that are out now. You can get them at Fred Meyer. Um, those are very good for sealing out the environment, sealing out dust. It'll also keep insects away. So really um, putting things inside a bag is the way to go. On the sheet I mentioned that uh, you want to kind of stay away from uh, just regular garbage style bags. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just that um, we've heard anecdotally that garbage bags tend to get thrown out with the garbage. So you don't want to have regalia mistaken for something and somebody in, in a hurry gets rid of it. So I put this slide in here to, to show you about um, touching and what can happen with a lot of undue touching. And that's why in museums we always wear uh, gloves. I don't, uh, I'm not suggesting that you wear gloves when you're using regalia, but I do want you to see what happens. This is a piece of marble that was on display at a museum and it says, please touch. So they, they want you to touch this piece. And then this piece of marble is protected by this piece of plexiglass here. And you can see in short order, this is what happens from the oils and the dirt that's on your hands. So just keep that in mind when, um, when you're handling a lot of things, that it will deposit oils and uh, dirt on the surface. 
And this is a, a Kixati frog tunic. It's actually here, I believe, because it was checked out. Uh, and I just wanted to show an example of, of uh, what we did with this uh, to kind of protect it. The, you can see along here there's been um, a lot of wear uh, on this piece over the years because it's been used. It's been um, used a lot, loved quite a bit. So here we have a lot of damage. And I was worried about uh, losing all of this material. We never want to lose all of something and we never want to have to replace all of something because that takes away from the history of the piece, takes away some information on it. So what we decided to do was we took um, new material and we sewed it over the top of the old material to protect it. Now the old material is still there and it's protected and this new material, if, if it's ever necessary, could be replaced again or completely taken off without damaging the piece. So that's kind of how we think about things in museums and how I'm trying to get the idea across that maybe there's something along these lines that you could do for your regalia if it's starting to fray or starting to get damaged, then you might be able to just sew something over the top of it to protect it and it wouldn't take anything away from it. And this is what it looks like today. We did both um, these edges and around the neck. We did get permission from the caretaker of this piece to do this first though. And here's a, uh, an example of the lengths that we go through to protect um, basketry style hats, for example, um, or uh, the Kixati frog hat, for example. We'll carve um, a, a special mount out of a stable foam. As I was saying, it's called ethafoam. We use this in museums. Uh, and you, you notice that it's on a big piece of, um, a big sort of board that we call gator board. Uh, and that's to protect the edges from this while it's in storage so that nothing will bump up against it. So this whole idea of kind of protecting things and getting them individualized, that's something that, that I hope that you can um, take away with you. Just briefly, I'd like to touch on light. Now, light is not something that you can worry too much about with your regalia, um, especially if you have it out in your, uh, while, while it's on um, display. But if you have it in your homes, you really want to be conscious of too much light falling on things. And this is, you can see this um, blanket really, uh, you look at the back side and you still have some of the, the yellows and some of the um, greens in here. The front side has been on display for so long that it's really lost a lot of those um, dye colors. Uh, so just be conscious, daylight ha is the most um, powerful light, has a lot of uh, ultraviolet in it, which is very high energy and can cause uh, the most damage. But even overhead fluorescent lights, they do have ultraviolet in them and can also cause damage. So just be conscious when, when these materials are out that over time they can fit, cause them to fade. And I just am showing this example. It's from a basket. This isn't necessarily regalia, but uh, it's just a good example. You can see this, this is a, a basketry tray and we're looking straight down into this shallow basket you can see the remnants of, of what the dye on the um, basket looked like. And if you flip it over, this is, this is what it used to look like. So um, you can see that we've lost almost um, all of the coloration on it. And when it gets to this point, there's really nothing that even I as a conservator can do. There's no magic bullet. There's no trick that we can bring this color back. It's just, it's gone forever. So light is something that we worry a lot about in museums. It's not necessarily something that you're going to worry too much about unless you have things on display in your homes. So the last few so slides i like to show um, is uh, I was thinking about what I could impart um, to you folks that might uh, be of help, which is different from the way we do things in museums. And in a museum, we have a lot of opportunity to uh, store things in very good storage conditions uh, and, and spend a lot of time caring for it. And I just wanted to show you what, what we might do with um, this type of uh, garment. We actually uh, don't like to have any folds that are, are really tight creases because over time, even in a textile, it seems fine, it seems fine, but when that textile gets to be 100 years old and it's been folded in the same spot for 100 years, you tend to get a lot of damage right in that spot. It gets very weak. So what we do is we, um, we always pad out all the folds. And that's why we've just taken a little bit of tissue paper. In this case, it's acid-free tissue paper. That would naturally be the best. But uh, if you don't have any acid-free tissue paper, it's still better to have something in there. See, we padded out these shoulders so that they don't get a lot of creases right where that beadwork is. There's been some damage on this beadwork in the past. 
and we've sort of stuffed out these arms so that this crease right here doesn't get too damaged. Now what I'd like to show in the next few slides is what, how we would prepare this for travel. Let's say if this were being checked out to be a part of a, a, a ceremony or something, this is how we would, we would uh, fold it. Um, here she's, naturally she's wearing gloves because that's just what we do in museums. We don't want to get a lot of, um, we don't want to get a lot of hand oils and dirts on them. So she's wearing her gloves and she's folding it right along um, a seam which is where it's, it's its strongest so that we, we avoid this, this crease right here. And then um, she's, she laid it down on, on a, a sheet, a clean cotton sheet, and you can see in this case it's just a fitted sheet. So it's not anything special, it's something you have in your home. Uh, and she's bunched up a, a bunch of that sheet here, so we've got the sheet uh, on the bottom, a sheet on the top, and it's all bunched up right here. So she can fold it over. So we've basically we've got three sheets involved in here. Then she's wrapping it up on the, on the back, folding it all up, and then it becomes just this package. Now I see a lot of robes and a lot of button blankets, a lot of things come out of duffel bags and they just, they're just not covered with anything. That may be alright, but that makes me nervous, you know, because I just see a lot of opportunity for that beadwork or those buttons to catch on something. I see a lot of opportunity for if it's not in a, you know, on a clean table, just to put it down, there's a lot of opportunity for dust and even insects to get, get at it. But if we, if we package it like this and then put it in the duffel bag, I would say that a lot less damage is going to occur to that. So that's kind of how we would think about it in museums. And I think that that's um, one thing that I'd like to impart to you. If that was something that you wanted to preserve something for a longer period of time, then uh, I would say wrapping it in something so that the sheet itself is what's taking the abuse and the damage and the wear and tear and not the regalia itself. Now for new things you probably won't see any damage for a number of years, uh, but for old things damage can occur very quickly, especially if they're already weakened by insect damage. So here's my contact information. I have it on this handout here. Uh, on the handout there's, I, I Xerox my card at the bottom of that, and I actually have a, a, an 800 number that works anywhere in the state. So you don't even have to pay to call me. You can just call me if you have any questions about how to care for things. Uh, and I, I do better when it's you know, a real concrete question. And so that's what I like to do now. Um, we have, we have oh, about 15, 20 minutes. And if anybody has specific questions, either about things that I've shown or about uh, regalia that you might have or even artifacts that you might have at your home and that you're concerned about, um, I can just open it to the floor if anybody has any questions. Sir? You referred to uh, when, we, when we have our regalia at home, uh, storing it, is it better to take it out of the box that we have it in and just store it? Or is it, does it hurt it just to leave it in the box or whatever? No, it doesn't hurt it to leave it in the box. I, I would prefer seeing it in the box. Um, and I would prefer, the best thing going is to have a plastic box that has a tight-fitting lid. That's the best thing that you can do. Just something you can get from Fred Meyer or any place, like a Tupperware-style box. And the reason is, is because that keeps insects, it's much less likely that insects are going to get into that. If you just have it in a cardboard box, the insects can find it. That would be my number one concern. The, the other thing, there's two more things that a plastic box is doing for it. One is it's keeping a little bit uh, better climate inside of there, a little bit more stable. Because outside, you know, in the summer we don't heat, in the winter we heat, in the winter it's very dry, in the summer it's more moist. And the box, will have, or a plastic box like that will help keep it more even. And the third thing is that the, the box itself, whether it's plastic or, or cardboard, doesn't really matter, it's keeping dust off of it. And even though dust seems totally benign, there's dust everywhere, we don't really care, dust actually really takes its toll on, on artifacts over the long term. I mean, as I said in the beginning of the talk, I'm thinking really next generation, next generation, passing these things down. We have to really kind of manage the risks now so that 100 years from now that piece will still be in good condition. And this goes for both wood and uh, leather and cloth? Yeah. I'm talking about... Uh, our ceremonial hats. Right. Uh, I've gone to some of my, uh, I've seen where the hats are taken out, I go to this particular place and the hats are being 
hard on the board and not in the box. So. Yeah. Well, my there may be a reason, uh, a spiritual reason for having those hats out, and and that, if that's the case, that's fine with me. But if you if you want my training is in material science, and if you want my opinion about preserving something, having something inside the box will will be better preservation for it than outside of the box. That's just that's a principle that I've seen time and time again in a museum environment to, to be true. That if we have things that are out on display and not inside cases, they get damaged much more easily and more quickly than things that are inside cases. So that's just the truth. But if for if there's a, a more over you know overpowering reason to have it out outside the box for a spiritual reason. There's some there are some beliefs um, and I don't know that much about this region, but I know when I was at the National Museum of the American Indian, there were requests to not have things put into plastic bags because for spiritual reasons. So they weren't, and that's fine. Um, it just means that from a, a, a material standpoint, those things won't last quite as long as the things that were put in plastic bags. So, Bob? Yeah, it's tough. I do a lot of storytelling on stage and stuff. And, and these, these two young guys sitting right here, I'm talking about them because. He knows you're talking about them. They dance a lot in, in our regalia. And, and, and after a couple hours, we're just sweats kind yeah. of pouring out of our body. Yeah. And, and I don't think it's a very good idea for us to put it in plastic bags as soon as we get home. That's a very it's, good it's point. The, yeah. so, uh, uh, should we just hang it a day or two? You know, depending on maybe this guy here uh, dances a lot. You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe three days. Three days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think of what, what would you recommend on, on drying yeah. the process of drying time? Uh, dry it out in a, a light or, or no, no no heat lamp but, but room temperature. Right. Is that yeah. I think that's a really good point and it's something that I hadn't really thought about. But um, if you know if it is dance and it is it does have you know moisture in it, it's it's a good idea not to put it in the bag right away. But I will tell you that it, it might depend on, on seasonally, different seasons but in a winter season, let's say, in an interior environment, like the environment we're in right now, you'd be surprised how little humidity is in this room. Because I measure humidity a lot as part of my job. And interior environments, warmed environments, environments that were heating up in the winter, we're taking, so air from the outside, we're bringing it inside and we're heating it up. And when we do that, we drop almost all of the moisture out of it. That's why it's so dry, even in the south, southeast like this where we live in a rainforest. So just having it in a, you know, not a basement or an attic, but in a, in a heated space for a couple of days would do the job. Because if you were to take a big garbage bag and you were to scoop up all the air in here right now in a garbage bag and you were to extract the moisture out of that air, you'd be surprised there'd only be about five drops of water in that air. So if your regalia was, you know, damp from dancing and you hung it up and after two days, there's probably not a lot of extra moisture that's going to come out of that. So I think a couple of days is, is a really good. In the summer months, though, if it's a summer dance and maybe it's been outside and on, you know, during celebration and it got, you know, rained on or misted on or whatever, then, you know, maybe a week or so. And having it out in the light, too, I think is, is part of this whole thing I was talking about with insects. Insects don't, this, this type of insect that attacks wool and, and feathers and leather, it doesn't like the light. And so having it out in the light for a little while before you put it in the bag, will the insect will go away from it, more, more likely than not. So it has kind of a dual purpose. But in general, if you're going to store that blanket or the robe or whatever for a really long period of time, between dances, I would say uh, storing in plastic bags will probably help it to last longer. In the back there? Scott, following up on that, if people are sealing things in sealed plastic bags or sealed Tupperware containers, can they use those uh, those little gel packs or something to uh, make sure that they're absorbing the moisture out of the, yeah. uh, just put one of those in the container? Can yeah, that, that's fine. If, if you want to go that route, that's fine. Um, but like I said, in if something is in that, 
you know, that would come more into play during the summer type months. Any time that we're using heat, I mean, just to give you an example, there's a rule of thumb we use in the museum that for every degree you go up in temperature, you go down 2% of humidity. So just to give you an example, even if it's 80% humidity outside during a winter day, let's say it's 50 degrees and 80% humidity, if you bring that in and you heat it up to room temperature, 70 degrees, that's, four, that's 20 degrees, you drop 40% humidity out of that air. So that 80% goes down to 40%. And, and mold doesn't start growing until it's around 60 or 70 percent or you know anything so but there's nothing wrong with doing that if you even those dry ease packets or anything like that you see those a lot in, in with computer stuff to keep it from corroding and so <coughs> any effort like that is not is not misguided <coughs> question I'm just a little confused there um, I was told that the story of our regalia especially wool that it should not be put in a plastic container and seal because you break down the fibers of the wool because the wool can't breathe. So now I'm hearing put it in a plastic. Right. Well, like I say, if there's if there's a spiritual reason for for that, that's fine with me. But from a material standpoint, if we're just talking about the material wool itself, it's not going it's not going to break down. It doesn't need to breathe just doesn't. In, inanimate objects that aren't imbued with spiritual powers, if, mm -hmm. if I may say it that way, from just a, a scientific standpoint, and I'm, and I'm not saying that you, know, you shouldn't believe that things have power and have lives and stuff, but from just a material standpoint, they don't need to breathe. And I've seen materials that were stored at various museums. I've worked at eight different museums over 20 years, and I've seen material that was stored, particularly like feathers, uh, in particular that have been stored in plastic and feathers that were not stored in plastic and the feathers that were in plastic looked nearly pristine after 30 40 50 years of storage so those types of things they just don't need they don't need to breathe and what what is happening and there's a lot of if you want to go the scientific route there's a lot of reasons why a closed environment will actually slow down deterioration because in order for chemical reactions to take place, they need oxygen. The less oxygen there is, the slower the reactions. So if you zip something up in a Ziploc bag, I mean, if we did an experiment, we had 100 years time, we put one of those in a plastic bag, a wool blanket, and a wool blanket just out on a table. We left it there for 100 years. The one that's out on the table would deteriorate more than the one in the bag. But as I say, you know, if there are a lot of beliefs about things needing, you know, needing to have a life and needing to have access to air and things, and, and if that's part of a spiritual belief, then I'm fine with that. That's, then we just deal with that. It's more like the table. Okay. Well, there, there is, um, you will see like garment bags that have, you know, one side being, um, one side being made out of cloth and one side being made out of plastic and stuff. And I think in the, short, in the short term, what that does is that keeps them from sort of smelling a little bit like stale. And that's just, that's just the way it is. The, the ebb and flow of, of air around them will air them out a little bit. And that may be true of regalia that's worn. But from a preservation standpoint, I don't think that it, it affects them. So it may be, like my wool suit, I do. I store in a garment bag that's not all plastic because I want it to kind of air a little bit. But it, the wool itself doesn't need to breathe. So. Question? I was kind of wondering about the storage in plastic bags going into a freezer. Mm -hmm. For some reason, it tends to put moisture into the bag also. Mm -hmm. it's air tight. So what, what's happening there? Well, when you bring your regalia out, it will have some to it. Yeah. Well, part of that is what I was saying. When you drop the temperature, you're you're dropping moisture out. But um, mostly, if if your regalia isn't damp itself and it's just at room temperature, and you you notice that it has insect infestation, and you put it in a Ziploc bag and you seal it up, the reason why we put it in the bag is so that the so that the condensation occurs on the outside of the bag, and not necessarily the inside of the bag. And we have a, a freezing process at, at our museum where we freeze a lot of material on a very regular basis. 
And as long as the material is dry, it doesn't gain any more moisture as, as long as the bag is sealed. So it could be part of it is if the bag isn't completely sealed, then there could be some transfer of moisture that way. But we, we, have, a, we have like a, a heated bag sealer that we use, so we know that. So I would suggest using a Ziploc bag where we can really get it sealed up. But there shouldn't be any real moisture gain in, in a sealed system like that. So it might be due to just something else, like either there's a hole in the bag or there would the, the regalia might have been very damp, let's say, because it was outside in the rain or something and then it goes in. That might actually occur. As the temperature drops, the moisture will drop out of it. Okay. That answer your question? Because I just tell you from my own experience that I've, I've never had it happen. But that's because in a museum we're dealing with very dry artifacts in the first place. So we don't, we don't generally get things wet. So I got a question there and I got a question over here in the back. Okay, where do you get the gel packs? Well, acid-free tissue paper. Right? Okay, acid-free tissue paper, um, we, we order ours online from a company. Um, but I, I want to believe that there's uh, more access to acid-free materials um, nowadays than there, than there has, has been before. And I'm not sure if um, a place like Joanne's Fabric that, that has tissue paper, whether that's acid-free or not. But that, that would be the place that I would look. I would look at some place like Joanne's Fabric or somebody that's offering you know, fabric and gift wrapping and see if that um, tissue paper is acid-free. The, the good news is that um, even today, if the tissue paper isn't sold as acid-free, it's much lower, has a much lower acid content than it did even 10 or 20 years ago. It's just because the processing of that material is different. Um, so I would say everything is in a balance. And I would say not padding out the, the um, creases at all is probably worse than using um, acidic tissue paper or tissue paper that is not acid free. It's not necessarily acidic, but um, that's the way I would look at it. That if I had no choice and didn't know whether it was acid free or not, I would go ahead and use it. What about the gel packs? The gel packs, you might try someplace like, um, I know I've seen them down at the uh, Marine Supply Store where they have these little canisters that, um, that have a silica gel in them. Uh, because they're used a lot in boats or you know places like that where it's very damp and you gotta put them in you know, your storage locker or something like that. that. That's where I would try something like that. Thank you. We had a question over here. Um, in the 80s and late 80s and up to the 90s, the uh, Ziploc bags uh, were neutral in smelling. Um, I've noticed uh, of late, uh, the, the bags have an awful smell to them. Um, some chemical preservative of the, that they put in them. You know anything about that? No, I don't. That's that's kind of news to me. Um, I do know that if you're using um, food grade Ziploc bags, so if you're talking about a Ziploc bag that you would buy at the store in in the grocery store, it's food grade, and it's unlikely that that there's anything on there that is is all that bad. It may it may have a smell to it. They do use a release awful smell. Uh, yeah. They do use a release agent on it. Um, to release it off the rollers, but if it's food grade, it can't. It, by law, it can't be toxic. So um, again, we use what we use in the museum world is we order Ziploc bags that are made uh, especially for museums in those types of situations. And I haven't noticed a smell on those. And in the same way, I was saying about the acid-free. Um, I think having something in its own individual bag is important enough that. I would run the risk of maybe there being something uh, in it that might maybe cause damage. I know what causes a lot of damage, and that's by not being in a bag. How does temperature uh, affect silica gel, high and low? Well, um, silica gel absorbs moisture, and if it's just regular silica gel, it it's very good at absorbing moisture and not good at giving off moisture. So uh, what you can do to recharge a pack of silica gel is you can just put it in the oven on warm and it'll drive off the moisture. So uh, if silica gel, I don't think it's, a, it's uh, function is affected by temperature, but just how much it absorbs depends on how, you know, what the temperature is. So I would imagine it's slower at colder temperatures. 
I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, to tell you the truth. I know that you know the more moisture there is, the more the faster it'll absorb it, and it reaches a certain. It's kind of if you graph it, it sort of tapers off the higher end. So silica gel that, that has very little moisture in it, you put it in a moist environment, it'll rapidly absorb moisture, rapidly gain weight, and then taper off as it starts to reach the limit of its capacity. And you can put that in an oven, you can drive off the moisture, and then you can start it over again. I don't know if that answers your question. But I don't know if you have silica gel at a freezing temperature, whether, whether it worked. I don't know if it's slowed down or not of absorbing moisture. I don't know the answer. It's probably the best at room temperature. A lot of things work really well at room temperature. Bob again? I just yeah. have one more concern. No, we'll, we'll take yours next. Sorry, we'll take you next. Go ahead. Go ahead. Have you come up with a way to clean uh, a beaded button blanket? Well, I was hoping nobody would ask me about cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> cleaning is just very, very uh, difficult, especially on older material. Um, and the only cleaning that that I recommend for a non-conservator, or I don't, want, I don't know how else to say that, for somebody who's trained in textile conservation, they have a lot of tricks. They can use a lot of solvents and different things to get stains out and to clean them. Um, it's not, that's not my field, so I don't do that kind of thing. The only thing that I can re recommend is um, what we call dry cleaning, or um, not dry cleaning like a chemical dry cleaning, but dry cleaning in that you just use a, a stiff brush and you just brush the surface. And we usually use a vacuum cleaner right next to it. So if I'm going to clean something like that, I would lay out the button blanket and I would use a, a paint brush that has never touched paint. So just like a two inch um, synthetic paint brush and I just brush the surface. And whereas that won't make it look new again, it actually overall will improve it. And what I found in, in you know, my career as a conservator, sometimes when you take something that's old and you try and clean it a lot, you end up getting just one part of it clean, and then the rest of it starts looking really old by comparison. Then you got to go after that, and then that, that part over there starts looking old, and then you just, you know, you got to attack the whole thing, and you end up doing more damage than good. So what I prefer is that something is old, it's had a life, sometimes there are stains, I can reduce those stains a little bit, but just really getting something, it's never going to look new again. So I just I've learned to accept that in in my attitude towards artifacts. Now, if there's a stain on it, like a specific stain, like a coffee stain, you can do really well to get a coffee stain off by using a cotton swab, like a Q-tip, and just using saliva. It sounds kind of weird, but we do that a lot in conservation. I just take a cotton swab, put it in my mouth, and I roll it on the surface right where that stain is. And the reason why that works is because your saliva isn't just water, it's actually a different thing. It, it's, it's an enzymatic solution. It has enzymes in there. It's a slightly elevated pH. It has a, um, a little bit of a, uh, more of a consistency than water. It's a little bit thicker. And I use that to clean off things, believe it or not. And that, um, we got a Chilcat robe back that had been out to ceremony and had a coffee stain on it. And I was actually able to reduce the coffee stain, not get it to disappear, but get it to be less noticeable by doing that. So those are just the two things that I recommend because anything else, if you get into washing that thing and I tell you to wash it and it goes wrong, you're gonna come back to me and say, well, you told me I could wash it. And then, you know, cause there's a million, well, this, but that, this, but that, don't do that. I don't know. It's a whole, it's a whole career that people have of how to clean textiles and it's not my career. So I'll only tell you two things, saliva on a swab, and brushing it with a with a paintbrush, and that'll make it look a little better. It's one of my jobs is, is to to search museums and 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 <coughs> pawn shops. <laughs> By the time regalia gets to a pawn shop, oftentimes the regalia is neglected and abused, and it ends up in a pawn shop. Right. And, and I, I found regalia that, uh, that, that uh, is quite old and quite valuable. And, and I know that, is, that from my experience, some of this regalia is worth into the thousands of dollars. And, and on, on the price tag of, of some of the things I've purchased, 
$175 you know, for, for a $10,000 object. Yeah. And, and, and when I purchased it, it, it really hurt, hurt me deeply to, to have to go to a pawn shop and buy something that I know that is so sacred. But, but sometimes it smells of alcohol or mm. cigarettes right. or, 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 you know, come out of a party place. Right. You know, so, so I never put it together with my other regalia. And, and I, I think it's something that uh, should be addressed at some point. Yeah. You know, pawn shop stuff, you know. Because <laughs> even the pawn shop is, is not a clean place. It's not a good environment, and, yeah. And, and so there needs to be some sort of process, I guess, on, on, on how to reintroduce the object back to, to, mm. to a place of dignity. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I think part of what I, or the answer on, on cleaning a textile, you, you could try some of that. Um, and at the Shell <coughs> Museum, we were very successful at getting, um, it wasn't regalia, but it was a, a, a tanned hide vest that had been in a smoker's house. And you could, when CJ had it in her office, you could, you walked into the office and you thought she'd been smoking a cigarette. That's how much this smelled like cigarettes. Not, not like a tan, you know, not like brain tanning, smoking or anything. I mean, it smelled like cigarettes. And what we did, which was very successful, was we wrapped it in Tyvek. I don't know if you know what Tyvek is, but it's that white stuff that they wrap houses in. And the reason why they wrap houses in is because it keeps moisture out, but it allows vapor to transfer through. And those funny white suits that they wear, you know, to do asbestos abatement or paint in or whatever, you can buy one of those down at the hardware store. You could cut that up into, you know, pieces. You could wrap this if it smells a lot like cigarette smoke. And that's what we did. We wrapped this thing in that Tyvek, and then we put it down inside kitty litter, believe it or not. Not the expensive kitty litter, but the cheap kitty litter that's just it's just clay, and there's a name for that type of clay. But what that, the reason why that clay works as kitty litter is because it absorbs a lot of odor, it absorbs a lot of, that's what it's designed to do. It's diatomaceous earth is what it is. And so we kept it in there, it had to be in there for about six months, and when we brought that out, it didn't smell like cigarette smoke at all. So that's something, that's a little trick that you might try, you know. It needs to have that tie back, though, to keep the kitty litter off of it, obviously, because we don't want that dust to get on it. And it needs to be tie back because there, if you just put it in a plastic bag, there's going to be no transfer to the kitty litter. So if you get one of those painting suits that they only cost five bucks or ten bucks, you wrap your thing up in that and put it inside the kitty litter, you leave it in a box for about six months and it'll, it'll kill that smell. Question? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Say you, uh, well, it, in the extreme case of a dried out basket, what would you do as far as trying to restore that back? Or at least make it so it doesn't get any more damage. Because right. pieces of it, when we received the basket, pieces of it had broken off and they just set it inside the basket. Right. And um, we were listening and, you know, so put it in a plastic bag. It, is there, I mean, it's it's very old and very very brittle. Is that all that can be done? Is well, uh, I haven't found anything. A lot of things have been tried to bring uh, moisture back to baskets, and a lot of things were tried when we, as conservators in the museums, when we were a little more daring with our treatments, a little more cavalier, um, and none of them were very successful in the long run. They imparted a little bit more flexibility in the short run, but anything that it imparts kind of moisture back to it that isn't water, let's say, uh, has negative sides to it. So like if you try and use something like uh, glycerin, which is not an oil, but not water, but uh, they thought that if we put a little bit of glycerin into these baskets, that maybe they'll be more flexible. They tried that for a while, and what happens is the glycerin, it's mobile inside there, and it usually comes to the surface because any kind of natural system is dynamic, and there's mo movement in everything. And so it comes to the surface and gets sticky, and then dust gets attracted to it, and then you got these baskets that look bad, you know? So 
there's just there's no oil that you could put on there. There's really no, and if you get them wet again, that's really a very brief moment where it's going to be okay. And then as soon as that moisture leaves, it's going to be even worse off than it was before. So there have been people who've said, well, we every year we take our baskets and we put them in the bathtub, and uh, they say our baskets look great. I feel like, well, you're just looking at a very short snapshot of that life of that basket. Even if it's the 50 years that you have it, or if you live to be 100 and you have that basket for 100 years, that's still a very short snapshot in the life of that basket. And um, I don't know if you were here, but the first three slides I showed were three baskets from our collection that were about 100 years old, and they've never had anything done to them, ever. So. You know, the only thing I can re recommend for something like that is, is just try and get it in the best environment possible. Now, I have had success with taking baskets that are misshapen and for a brief period of time boosting the humidity, like putting them in a plastic bag with a little cup of water or a sponge, getting the humidity up so that they become very flexible and I get them out to the shape that I want and stuff them out with acid-free tissue paper and then when they dry, they hold that shape. But I only like to do that like once or twice because anytime you introduce moisture and then take it away again, which would naturally happen, then those, cell, those cells that have been pumped up, they shrink even more than they did before. There's this principle called hysteresis. And it, you, can only, you can only do that a couple of times before those cells start breaking down and you get the problem of very weak plant material. So there are things that you can do to not you, but a conservator can do. There are things that one can do to restore baskets and put those pieces back together, but they're very time consuming. Most people don't want to spend $1,000 on restoration for a $100 basket or a $500 basket. So, all I can say sometimes is for those types of materials is that, you know, is try and enjoy them as, as much as you can for, you know, as long as they're there. and and try and get them in as best environment as possible. Keeping dust off of them will, will preserve them for a little bit longer. Baskets are kind of tricky because if they're out and you see them and you enjoy them, they tend to get a lot of dust and a lot of debris and things in them. So just general upkeep of them and not just letting them sit there forever and ever and ever is, is good. But I don't think that there's anything you can do. If you, if you find something, let me know. I'm waiting for the magic bullet, but a question? Yeah, I have a question. I have a, I have a plant hat that's uh, close to 100 years old. It's made of wood. Mm -hmm. and a couple things I'm worried about is cracking, mm -hmm. drying out, and um, the fading of the paint mm -hmm. and cleaning. So there's actually three things. Okay. So can you comment on those? Sure. Um, the paint, the paint itself, the, the paint that masks or hats um, are usually painted with is actually pretty light stable. So in that sense, um, I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. The kind of colored uh, things that tend to fade a lot in light are, are usually on textiles or paper. So I've seen masks that have been in a lot of light and they generally don't fade as much as things that I've shown. So um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, in terms of the wood, uh, if it's 100 years old, uh, it's actually gone through a lot of changes over those 100 years. And uh, the stresses that were new in it have probably figured out how to release themselves or how to relieve, release that tension. So when I see old wooden hats or old wooden masks, uh, I'm not as worried about them cracking as something that is new. That's, that's kind of a new problem. But anytime you change that environment uh, and you go from sort of a wet to a dry, back to a wet, that's when you, you need to be concerned. So, um, if you really want to preserve that thing, the, the best thing to do is to have some sort of tub or, or pelican case or something just specifically for that, that while you're transporting it either on a plane or on the ferry or even in your car or carrying it into a building, that you put it inside that thing and seal it up. Because it's during those transfers from, you know, if you brought it out from the parking lot in here today, you know, I would hope that it would be in a plastic bag or something, because if it gets wet, then it gets this rapid infusion of water, it boosts it up, 
then you bring it in here, it's probably only 20% humidity in here, and it shrinks down. And it'll do that for a long time, and maybe nothing will happen. Maybe in your lifetime, my lifetime, nothing will happen. But over the long run, there's only so much time that, so many times it can do that. So that would be my recommendation is, it would be really worthwhile having, buying a Pelican case, even though they're expensive, they're like 500 bucks. But if it had its own personal case, that would probably do a lot to, to preserving it. Okay. Sure. I have a second part to that question, sorry. Um, one of um, my relatives has a clan hat that is developing a crack, uh, and it's made of wood. How, how would he stop that crack from going up further? Yeah. The hat? Well, a lot of, again, a lot of things have been tried in the past, and, and what happens is if you put anything in there, especially like a, a, a lump of glue, so let's say we inject glue or we somehow we get glue in there, what that actually does is it, it provides a mechanical fulcrum because um, at that spot where it's really hard, uh, that wood is still going to move. It's going to be dynamic, but that glue plug isn't going to move, and I've seen the cracks go way beyond those those bits of glue. So the glue, I think, is actually um, increasing the chances that that crack will go further. So there, there has been, uh, in the conservation literature, people have developed a type of fill that was made with um, silicone caulk that was bulked out with, um, with a material that is not readily available, but it's called glass micro balloons. It's the same stuff that they use to fill for boats and fiberglass. So they took, they took silicone, that rubbery stuff, and they mixed this, these micro balloons in it, and they stuffed it down in there. And what that did was it, it stretched with it. And the theory goes that that would keep the stress off of the, the point of the crack. Now, we won't know whether those are successful for a long time, but so far they seem to be somewhat successful. So that's the only kind of film material that I know of that doesn't cause more damage in the long run. But again, that, the, that hat or mask is dynamic in a changing environment. It changes with the environment. So the more the environment changes, the more the mask is going to change, the more stress is on it. So that's why I say, if we look at it from a preventive, a risk management side of it, spending money on, a, on an expensive case like those Pelican cases that seal it out and only bringing it out in the same kind of environment that it left, so if it leaves your home and it comes in here and we open it up, then it doesn't uh, receive the same kind of stresses that if you put it under your arm and you know, carry it from the car into here. I've seen, you guys have seen it all. I'm not telling you anything you haven't seen. I mean, you know, regalia is, is really kind of a, uh, a utilitarian thing, it, it gets used a lot and so it undergoes a lot of stresses for those reasons. So I think if it really is a hundred years old and, and has some fragility to it, the best thing you could do would be to uh, provide it with its own case. Any other questions? Well, we managed to use up most of the time. I'm, I'm really happy and pleased to see this number of people come. I, I thought with the competition I would only have like about three people in here, but um, I'm very pleased. Thank you for coming. There, there's a little handout here. Um, I don't have, I only brought about 20 of them, but um, there, it, it outlines some of the things I've talked about and my telephone number and my email address is on there and so if you think of any question that you didn't get answered today you can certainly email with it as part of my job at the state is to answer questions for people so uh, I actually get credit if you call me I put a little mark in my book so it helps me to help you sure thank you for coming <laughs>